So we're Wanderlust. I'm Andy Austin. This is Ida Benedetto. We're really glad you guys all came out to help us uh, do awesome stuff. Uh, so this is the Wanderlust School of Selling Out. We. I'm going to speak into the microphone. Wow, that does help, doesn't it? Um, uh, this is the Wanderlust School of Selling Out. We're exploring the chemistry between creativity and commerce this month. This is the third discussion in our series. Everybody, a round of applause for Aiden. <laughs> Yay. Um, uh, today, we are exploring the topic of clients uh, and how to protect yourselves from the people who want you and the people who you work you can't live without. We're um, really uh, we're, we're really stoked to have a lot of awesome people here. Some of you we don't know. Some of you we do know, and we love you very much. Um, we've got John Morris here. We've got Abe Berkson from Odyssey Works. We've got Eric Clough, the original key master himself. Um, and uh, we're going to have a little bit of um, we're going to have a little bit of discussion up front, and then we're going to open things up to questions. So, uh, yeah, be ready for that. And uh, on stage, we have moderating, moderating Jeff Stark, we've got, um, who's joining us from Brazil quite recently, is Lorenzo Bastani. We have Earl, the man in the magnificent hat. Thanks for being here with us, Earl. We're yeah. super glad that you're pleasure. We're super glad that you're here. Um, we uh, we have Ian Tran and Neil Selkirk. Thanks so much for joining us, Neil. Um, we can't wait to see where we get to go with you guys. Thanks for being here. Thank you. So we'll have a discussion for about an hour, um, and then we'll turn it over to no audience questions. So I think you all got notebooks when you came in. Um, you know, be sure to, to take notes and be ready with tough questions. Thanks. Hey, everyone. Um, my name is Jeff Stark. Uh, I am going to moderate this panel this evening. I've been asked to moderate it on behalf of Ida and Nathan, and I'm grateful for that. Um, also grateful to uh, Kickstarter for, ha for having us, so I appreciate that. Um, first thing that I wanted to do was just sort of uh, go through what, what I'm going to do tonight. Um, and this is the most that I'll talk the whole time, so, so, so bear with me here. Um, the first thing I wanted to do is figure out who you guys are. So by a show of hands, it's a little dark for us, but we're going to kind of do this and, and see who you are. So um, how many people in the uh, house tonight identify themselves as artists? Raise your hands. Real high. 20, 25% maybe. OK, how many? of the folks in the house uh, are in the advertising or marketing industries. OK, great, like, <laughs> mm, OK, maybe like an eighth. All right, good. Um, anyone in creative services of any sort? Not necessarily, right? Great, another quarter or so, good. Um, how many students? Good. All right, freelancers? Who freelances? Good. Um, how many of you in the house tonight are clients? Good. All right, so kind of as many clients as people who are in advertising and marketing. Um, all right, so second thing. Um, that's who these guys are, by the way. So now that we can see. Um, second thing, I was in the house last week, and I noticed that the sound was a little quiet toward the back. How are you guys right now? Raise your hands real high if you're good. OK, so it's on you guys if we are too quiet, like yell at us, speak up or something. Or the sound guy's right behind you. You can just tell him. <laughs> um, all right. so. When I do this, uh, when I moderate panels, what I sort of uh, expect or what I sort of think of my role is that I'm an advocate for the audience. So um, what I'm trying to do is kind of keep the conversation moving. 
um, try to keep things from getting boring. Um, and Neil brought up a great point, uh, something that I should try to do tonight, which is that I should look for disagreements among the panel. So he says that we should sort of be disagreeing with us, each other. Um, panels are often boring because it's just a bunch of people who are kind of all in the same industry, all patting each other on the back. So we'll try to find disagreements tonight. Um, uh, there are going to be questions at the end. Um, if you guys think that I'm dropping the ball, if you think that I've like horribly overlooked a really obvious question, something that needs a follow up, and it's just unbearable for you, get up with a hand and I'll try to find you in the audience and we'll just be like, get to you. Um, make sure that it's on topic though and it's sort of a, a rebuttal to something that's already happened. Um, one of the things that we're looking for tonight is anecdotes. Uh, I am giving everybody a pass. Uh, name dropping is okay. Name drop all you want. This audience is not judging you for it. In fact, they want more and more of it. So, so tell us who you're talking about. And um, we have four people from four, or I guess five people from five different industries up here. Um, and so we all talk about our work and our work with others in different ways. And we use different jargon and different buzzwords uh, and different terms of art and vocabulary in general. So what I will try to do is get you guys to, if you say something like an AE, I will ask you to tell me what an AE is in your world. And it's not necessarily out of ignorance. It might be. I might not know. Um, but it's also to communicate, since we have different people in different industries, we'll try to keep all the language on the same. OK. So here's who we have uh, in one word terms. We have um, Neil, the photographer, uh, Ayand, who is a technologist. Technologist, is that fair? OK. Um, we have Earl, who is a director. He's many things, but you know, video directing uh, film. And we have um, Lorenzo, who is a consultant. Um, these are incredibly reductive. Almost everybody up here has done something else. But that's sort of who you're, who you're, you're, you're looking at on the panel. All right, the end of my spiel. I'll begin and let you guys get going. Um, who is the worst client you've ever had? <laughs> oh my god. It was years ago. Yep, good. But it was Lauren Hill. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Why? She wouldn't agree to anything. Um, in part, she had been completely left out of the conversation. And then she arrived um, in production the day before we were about to shoot. What were you working on? Uh, we were working on Killing Me Softly. Yeah. Um, that thing. I think the guy that directed it is now um, in prison for <laughs> something. Anyway, it was, um, it was a very bizarre set of circumstances. I didn't live here at the time. I lived in, the, in England. And um, it was a fucking hullabaloo. Um, she just, you know, she wouldn't agree to anything that we were shooting, uh, but she went through the motions. Yeah. Um, I tried to appease her on a number of occasions. Um, I wanted to do the project very much because I knew it was going to be extremely successful. And we got through to the cut, and every cut we showed her, she had issues with. Uh, that went on for six weeks. And then the project was taken away from me. Uh, I was paid and thanked. And then she got one of her friends to come in and create a video that was them sitting in a theater throwing popcorn at what I'd shot. Um, <laughs> and that was it. Yeah. Was like, okay. Do you think? Uh, <laughs> I'm all right now. <laughs> do you think that she? Um, why? Why do you think that she? I think she'd been left out yeah. of of the mix completely, and it was their first, you know. Me? Lean forward. Thank you. It's the beard. So she'd been left out of the process. All right. Who's next? 
okay. Um, they, if you use the term worst client, there are a lot of different forms of worstness a client can take. Um, the most reprehensible client I think I can think of at the moment, um, naming names, is a, an amazing company called Hill & Knowlton, which is a public relations, very, 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 very big and well-connected public relations company you may never have heard of because they like it like that. But if you happen to own a chemical company or, a, um, or an oil company and you have catastrophic oil spill or you poison tens of thousands of people, your first call is always to Hill and Knowlton. Um, and they do damage control. Um, and I, I didn't really know this. The first time I worked for them, it was for a steel company. And uh, I did their annual report maybe for a couple of years. And then the third year, it came up and they said, um, we want to do the annual report this year honoring our employees. And um, the people who make the steel. And so I had this, it was a great job. You know, I went off into steel country. It was during somebody's recession. Everything was hideous. It was when they were beating up um, Japanese cars and things in the steel industry because they wanted American steel to go to American cars. And, um, <clears throat> and they were very hostile. As, as the person doing an annual report, you basically represent management, and they know that. And so, um, I mean, just for one particular picture, you go into a steel mill, um, they tell you that your assistant's a woman, she can't come in. And I say, yeah, that's ridiculous, out of the question. They say, well, she's got the wrong shoes on. Um, so we went and bought steel-toed shoes for my assistant. And, uh, and then we went in and, and to, to try and get the, um, uh, to, to get some kind of response from these guys who've spent 30 or 40 years in, in a steel mill and are inherently hostile, I did what I very, very rarely do, is I spent literally hours with them um, getting across the idea that I wasn't there to hurt them, you know, that I was actually all right. And eventually got a really wonderful photograph and I got a, did the whole annual report. And about a year later, I found out that the actual function of the annual report was to soften these people up so they could cut their wages. Um, you know, that's about as bad as it can get, I think, in that sense. This has nothing to do with creative stuff, but that's my worst time. Great answer. Yeah. If I can, uh, that's a pretty good segue to tell a story about, another story about tremendous incoherence. Um, so I have, I have trouble primarily working with clients that uh, preach something and, and then act in a diametrically opposed way. I think you don't need to, you don't need to embrace all the noble values, but if you do publicly, then you should make a concerted effort to, to be consistent with, with, with all of that. And uh, we've been working for the past few years with a, uh, with a company in Brazil that uh, is, is recognized for uh, having uh, quite an incredible track record on, on issues around sustainability. And not just over the last 10 years, but over the last 30 years since the company was founded by this really um, incredible visionary. Um, but working with a client, uh, you realize that um, the relationship is very predatory and is very uh, exploitative, in a sense. Um, and that the notions that um, you know, everyone should be treated uh, respectfully and with compassion, um, it, it really gets undermined. Uh, in the bargaining power that you don't have when you're making decisions with and for the clients. And there's one story in specific. Um, uh, this one professional in Brazil, as, as you can imagine, um, the line between professional and personal is, all, is often blurred. Um, things are a little more informal. And uh, there's this one uh, client that approached me and started becoming my friend. And uh, we started hanging out, in fact, outside the office. And a few weeks into the, the friendship, um, she requested a proposal for a project that she was going to spearhead at the company. Uh, it was a pretty audacious project. It was to create uh, the open innovation model or system of the company, how it's going to interact with internal and external stakeholders to source innovative ideas. And uh, when I started the, doing the proposal, she said, listen, um, I don't want you to define any of the parameters of this project. 
Um, I have $250,000, um, and it needs to get done until the end of the year, but let's not put parameters. Let's not decide exactly how many people are going to be consulted. Let's not decide exactly how many people are going to be, uh, in what kind of context they're going to be spoken to, what technological tool we're going to create to support this. Um, let's just agree that we'll do that in real time because now everything's beta, uh, rapid prototyping, so let's not plan too much. And um, I, I you know, took the benefit of the doubt, I gave her the benefit of the doubt, and I did that, and then, you know, um, make a long story short, uh, as the project started taking shape, uh, we all realized uh, just how uh, big the scope of this endeavor was, and other executives started coming in and demanding of our, of our company um, this, this commitment that you know, wasn't on paper. And um, I thought I was, being, I was safeguarded because I had this personal friend uh, that was kind of intermediating the relationship. Um, but there was a specific moment in the project where we were in a conference room with her, ex her leadership uh, where she needed to tell them that we had this pre, uh, preconceived agreement, you know, and she explicitly didn't, and we were exposed, and the contract was rescinded, and we the, lost all the other relationships we had with the other departments and other brands of that company over the course of two or three months. Um, now, what's the connection between what I said in the beginning and this story is that uh, clearly, if, if you know, this is a company that um, uh, puts a strong value on human interaction uh, and people with people and people with the planet, uh, given how um, it depends on the raw materials that it extracts from, from uh, Mother Nature in order to commercialize the products that it, that it manufactures. Um, but you can tell that, the, that there's no culture of that inside the company. Um, there are sustainable products. Um, it's a sustainable brand uh, as you look at, 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 at it visually. Um, the location of the office is sustainable in the sense that it's in the outskirts of Sao Paulo. It's got nice quality air. But the people aren't, right? So there's, it's, it's all a big facade. Uh, and there's these moments of truth in the relationships that you have with, with your clients where you see that you're actually uh, experiencing a tremendous incoherence or you're actually an accomplice in that. Because to the extent that you're not taking a stand against that kind of uh, uh, behavior or interaction, that passivity in, in, a, in, a, you know, in an essence is um, undermining what you stand for as well. So it's a tough situation. It makes you go home feeling emotionally drained. Uh, it really makes you stop and question, like, what exactly am I doing and, wh and why, you know? And to me, a client that creates that kind of feeling inside you is, it's tough, but it's, it's part of the, I mean, it's part of the, it comes with the territory, you know? Many, many moments, that's exactly when you kind of understand what you came for. I am. Absolutely, yeah. So um, I was going to tell a story about, um, about s scoping and, um, and controlling scope, but that's boring. Um, that, that's sort of the, the, the core of, of all of these, um, of the, the wisdom of, of managing clients, right, is that, that you need to define everything up front, you know, define what you're going to do, define the budget, um, and then de define the constraints around that. Um, so, but anyway, um, in this one project, um, we, we were working for a huge Japanese electronics manufacturer who I can't name or someone will fire me somewhere. So, um, so anyway, huge, huge Japanese electronics manufacturer. We does have- Does it rhyme with pony? Um, no, it does not. It does not. Um, more, more syllables. Um, um, so, uh, so anyway, we're, 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 our, we get this, this, this scope. I don't even get to write the scope. This gets handed to me. The, the schedule gets handed to me in the budget. What's and the I, scope? Um, Ah, thank you. So scope of work is, um, is something that you would put into your contract, and that defines the range of tasks that you're going to complete for the job, for, for your client. So um, that, and, and along with your scope, which is what you're going to do, should always come what you're not going to do. So, um, and, and what you need from them to do. So yes. what you need them to do would be uh, the, the dependencies, um, that you would make a long list of. What you are not going to do would be your list of exclusions. So that's all the stuff you don't want to do. Um, so anyway, we, we, we did all that kind of, of, of scope control stuff up front. Nonetheless, we, um, 
I get handed this schedule, um, and, and I get on the phone with, with the, the project manager on their side, and I'm the project manager on our side, and, and they say, okay, well, we, we need all of your deliveries, and a delivery, a deliverable is, um, is basically whatever you are giving to the client that they are paying you for. So, that, so all of our deliveries now, she asks for them to come a week in advance. It's already a crazy tight schedule because you know you have to uh, make the creatives in. I work in a studio environment, so the creatives have to make the thing. Then internally, someone needs to review the thing, say it's okay, and then we show it to the client. So there's already all these like internal levels. We turn, then we need to pass it to the client a week before it goes to their internal client. So then um, once we, so now our schedule has been cut by a week. Plus, we need now to give them time to translate our decks. Our, um, a, a deck is, is like a PowerPoint presentation. Um, so now they need three extra days to translate the already presented deck into Japanese so that they can show it to their, to their bosses. So we can come and present it to their bosses. Um, and then these presentations were amazing. Usually you can kind of read, like I can see you guys moving around. Usually there, there's some way to sort of read, read your client. But in this case, with Japanese business culture, which I had just learned about for the you know, first time in this project, um, we're sitting there, we're on like three, three we're, we're talking to Yokohama and Tokyo, and, and we're in Soho on these like three-way, very fancy video conferencing software. Um, and, uh, and they're totally silent. So it's just like a webcam on them and all of us. And, and we're just like, we're like, uh, give me something here, you know? <laughs> like, I was like, anyway, so, um, so then after that, then we need to get like two other levels of feedback. So it was, it was a great lesson in, um, in, in talking about internal uh, pre-deliveries and previews. And, and uh, it was very important in that case to, um, to say, no, our delivery is our, is our delivery and you can, can deal with um, you know, your in, internal back and forth later. Is, is what made them such a bad client the, the demand that they put on you that was unreasonable or was it the misunderstanding that you guys were having at two companies working with each other? I think it's the misunderstanding. It's, it's the shaving away at the constraints that you defi define in advance. And so, um, you know, in, in, in most projects, you, have, you, know, you, you try to tightly control your, your schedule and everything that's going to happen along the way as much as possible. But then I find actually, you know, that with, <laughs> no offense, but the corporate clients can be the most demanding um, sometimes. And, and, and you know they have their many levels of executive stakeholders and the executives mm -hmm. to the executives and and so and so's you know the guy behind the secret golden door in the office that nobody ever gets to talk to and so there there's always this chance for major major change to come in late in the game because yeah. of some you know high level stakeholder up in, in there you guys have worked all of you guys have worked with really big companies are is i in right are are the big companies the worst? Is it true? Are they the ones that want to squash you? Or? Well, I have a question for Anzo. Yeah. Um, you sort of chastised yourself for becoming a participant in an evil culture. Um, have you ever been in a situation, let's say in a large company, um, where you've in any way been able to influence that, that culture rather than just be subjected to it? Sure. I think chastise is, a, is a too, perhaps too strong of a word, but uh, I think so. I think. Um, I tend to say this to my team because, like I said, it's so emotionally draining and sometimes very discouraging that a lot of people quit and they're like, you know what, I'm, I don't want to subject myself to this anymore. It's too toxic. Mm -hmm. you know? And a lot of people do come through the company uh, and there's just not, comes a point where you're not predisposed to that anymore. But what I tell my team is that, uh, guys, you know, this is actually when our work is actually happening. It's when, it's when the, the old and the new paradigms, they kind of meet head on. Uh, and these values that for us seem so obvious, uh, to them it's somewhat foreign. And you can't, uh, you know, when you're a 45, 50 year old, you know, very egocentric person sitting on a lot of money and a lot of power and a lot of influence, it's hard for you to stop and, and uh, you know, challenge that, your carcass a little bit, you know, and challenge, you know, everything that, that brought you to that position in the first place. Uh, so I think that's exactly when you need to have compassion as well and understand that it's not y you against them. You know, it's, there's, there's an evolutionary process that's taking place at that exact moment, and um, you're, you're part of that situation that's materialized. There's a catharsis going on, and what are you going to do about it? You know, you can shy away from it, or you can try to be a protagonist within it, uh, and very subtly uh, 
through what you believe in and through your actions signal that your intent is actually constructive. You know, and it's not, you know, it's not about taking them to court, it's not about you know, turning their back on them. Unfortunately, in that specific situation, uh, you know, it happened two years ago, uh, I didn't have that, that kind of mindfulness about that situation. So that's a relationship that I, I, I never revisited of that person. You know? uh, but it's because that happened that I'm so much better prepared to deal with other kinds of situations that show up. Because we talk about clients, 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 companies, organizations, but it's people. Right? It's people with people the whole time, no matter what. And uh, one of the most liberating things uh, from, from my perspective and my experience, which is limited as compared to you guys and probably many people uh, in front of me as well. Um, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, what did you ask me? Um, it was whether you'd ever actually been able to influence it. And I can't help thinking that, yeah. that you have this fabulous title, which is consultant. Um, I did it to him. I, uh, well, it is. <laughs> well, it sort of is what you do, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, which means that, that on the face of it, you're invited in to give an opinion. Yeah. Um, that, that most people who are hired as creatives Don't want to hear. Are, not, you know, are, are expected to produce something for which there is a preordained notion on the part of the employer. Um, rather than that you're actually expected to speak and be listened to. Yeah. Although I did once do a, um, a job for Con Ed um, years and years ago, and, um, uh, and we actually got a sort of memo from Con Ed which said, we never take the advice of our outside consultants. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So don't have an opinion. Yeah. Well, right, yeah, yeah. For which yeah. we will pay you handsomely. Right. We, yeah. we once, I uh, was, we, we were, we had come all the way through the design process on this website um, for, um, for, I guess I can say it's for the Holocaust, Holocaust Museum. Anyway, um, and the Holocaust Museum in DC. Yeah. Okay. Um, and and there was this late stage change where we had totally finished the design, and they, and there were stakeholders who started paying attention way too late in the game um, and they had one of their their you know branding people I think this is similar to your Lauren Hill situation where they just should have been brought in earlier and that that's really I mean I actually write it into contracts you know the name of the executive stakeholders so the people who ultimately have to make the decision um, and make sure that they are signing off all along um, the process but anyway these folks were brought in too late and they took one of our designs um, that was about to be approved, so we're like five rounds in or something of, of design feedback, revision, blah, blah, blah. Um, and this, this director just, just took our, printed the design out and just started drawing on it like with a marker, and they were like, here's a wireframe. And so a wireframe is, uh, is, is like, a, it's a, like a shop drawing that you then put design on top of, that you skin with design. So anyway, drawing on our, on our design, and then they like scan it and they send it back, and they're like, "Here, like fix it." And this is after like way after we're supposed to be in production of actually building the thing, but that you know that happens I think with with nonprofit clients and with corporate clients that that certainly the the higher up the food chain in um, you know in nonprofits that you get if it's really places that people want to work, you have people internally who are you know. Their their applicant pool is huge, and people are fighting to get in there. And then they get kind of, you know, a little too important for them. You know, they think that they're the most important ever, and they can be extremely difficult and not pay attention to any of the rules and you know that kind of thing. And that that spans the gamut, I think, of of you know just people doing very public work. So can I ask my question now? Sorry, it's all right. Mm -hmm. um, because I think that, I, that was good, um, but I actually am interested. Is I in right? Size of corporation. Yeah, is that, the, is that the worst? I think it depends. For me, it always depended on how high up in the corporation the client who was directly interested in what I was doing, meaning it could be a huge corporation. And if the chairman knows what I'm doing and wants it done right, I can do anything. Um, if I'm on the sixth layer down, you know, you're a dead man. Mm -hmm. And if the corporation doesn't have six layers, you know, so if you have a company, you know, like a, um, a fashion designer, you know, you to, it's a Calvin Klein or something like that, you're working for Calvin Klein, you know, then boom, you get, you get what you want. 
Yeah, or, you know. small client team. Is, having a small client team is so is critical, or you know, is is not a guarantor for success, but is certainly important. There's a designer um, from Pentagram. I think it's like it's like Michael Beirut or something. It's one of these very famous um, designers who who only takes on projects when he can meet with um, with the boss, when the boss will be in all the meetings, and you know, having access to the ultimate decision maker is so critical. Different in showbiz, right? Uh, no, it's um, very much the same. Um, when you're there with the client, and the bigger the client, and as long as there's a, a direct communication between you and them, um, you, you have more freedom. Um, I found that in a couple of cases with, you know, what, what I guess is termed like A-list artists, um, Madonna being one of them. Uh, Bono being another, uh, and the communication is when the communication is direct, you have freedom to to do what it is that you do. Um, you know, another set of circumstances that I think is interesting is I consult to um, a non-profit, a charity that um, is filled with NGOs, and as a creative, I have to come in and and design um, messaging for them and a brief that speaks outwardly to an audience. Um, but when you're working with somebody that does not understand the creative or the creative process at all, uh, it becomes extremely difficult uh, to the extent that, of course, you have to give them what it is that they need, um, but you're doing it in another way, whether that be through storytelling or through, through um, visual imagery, you know, dealing with the emotional content of, of a situation uh, and continuously going back and forth with them where they want to maybe talk about st statistics and numbers and all of that kind of stuff. I bring this up because I'm in the middle of a project right now that is extremely frustrating because I know what it is that they want. Um, I've worked with them many times before um, and if I say so myself, it's always been successful. But still I go back and forth with them um, in this issue of... And then what happens in, in, in circumstances like that are, is um, people aren't necessarily as transparent as you would like them to be. And you need them to be absolutely transparent in order to allow you to go off and do what it is that you do. So there's a lot of circling back, a lot of circling back, a lot of circling back, a lot of fear on their end. And that can get very awkward and very time consuming. You, you talked about, I mean, you just, you just said what they need. You knew, you knew what they need. Mm -hmm. um, my guess is that all of you work with clients who there's a schism between what they want and what they need. Mm -hmm. Is that true? And if so, how do you identify that schism? And how, how, do, you, how do you bring them, how do you bring them, like you're talking about, to, to what they need, how, you, how, how do you get them to that point? That's a very interesting question. Um, interesting bad or? No, interesting, interesting <laughs> yeah, interesting bad and interesting good. Um, it's, you know, again, it, it, it's, it's, it's generally, you know, you're having to get on a one-on-one -on -one with whoever the power is. Uh, and you know, allowing them to trust in what it is that you you do. And last year, I worked with Ida and Nathan on a project. Um, with who? Sorry. With Wonderlust on a project okay. um, that was um, it was a fundraiser, um, a very large fundraiser, hundred thousand dollar tables, fifty thousand dollar tables, twenty five thousand dollar tables, um, a huge program, red carpet. Um, and performance space, and within that space each year, um, I create an, in, an installation of descriptions that speaks to the subject, whatever the message is that is the theme for that year. And um, they just never seem to understand what it is that you're doing or trying to do, and they all sit there and smile and agree with you, and they all run away and talk about you. Um, it, it's kind of bizarre, but um, the piece that we achieved last year was an installation uh, where it was a celebration of the 10 years of this particular organization. 
and we chose to use that theme that you know that and and thank all those that had been a part of uh, not only this issue but had donated during the course of the year and and and, and been supportive and we did it in a really really beautiful way but for weeks leading up to that um, unbeknownst to me everyone thought I'd lost my mind um, <laughs> but then at the end of it they were all you know rapturous applause and you know you did it again and then you go into the same thing again the following year and I think a lot of it is a lot of that kind of stuff is fear-based uh, on on their part um, and it's just a it's just um, it's a, it, it, it's tricky coming from a creative background working with you know an NGO or whoever the client is um, and what it is that they're asking for um, without a full understanding as to what it is that they're asking for and the execution of that. Yeah, fear is, fear is the, the key. Um, uh, and that's why if the, you're dealing with the big guy on top, mm, he may have fear, but he has to look as if he doesn't have any fear. And um, so when you win is when they think you know better than they do, which almost never happens at a low level because they can't afford to do that because they're afraid of the consequences. And so that's either achieved by being so incredibly preeminent in your field that everybody um, knows you're the man, and if you blow it or if everybody hates it, they say, well, he was the man, um, or that you've actually done it before. I mean, they'd love it if, if you can show them exactly what they want, and they say, yeah. I think I'll disagree, dis be the right. first one to disagree now. Great! <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, uh, again, uh, everything I say has the caveat that you, 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 know, you, you have more uh, experience under your belt, so this is my humble opinion, but I think it's not about knowledge. It's really not about knowing more or knowing less, because um, if you're in a situation where two people are together and one specifically feels that he knows more than someone else, one will feel superior and the other one will feel inferior. And the ability to engage in, let's say, sustainable dialogue in that kind of situation is very low. Um, I think there's something which is ageless and is not uh, um, based on, it could be based on previous experience, but it not necessarily has to be, um, which is just intuition. It's just human interaction. It's just the eye to eye. You know, it's the handshake, it's the hug, um, it's the body language. It's something that makes you feel like that person uh, is concerned about your well-being and understands that there's an interdependence there that needs to be honored. Um, and uh, I have the good fortune of every once in a while feeling that I'm in that kind of relationship with people that um, have maybe 40, 50 year, more years uh, than I do or come from completely different parts of the world that I was you know, brought up in, have different customs, values, even points of view about the world. But there's this very common denominator which is even difficult to talk about. Uh, but it's implicit to all of us you know, and within the human condition, uh, which kind of uh, comes to the surface at these moments. And that's when the vote of confidence is given. You just feel like this person's, you know, uh, we're in this together. Um, because if I had to depend on being that guy and having a track record, I'm, I just turned 34 years old, there's not much that I can speak to. Um, but uh, life's given me the opportunity to uh, live in many different countries during those 33 years and uh, come into contact with, 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 with people um, that have very varied repertoires and to understand kind of the immensity of the world and be marveled by that. Um, for some reason, when I'm with people, especially people that are different to me, I feel connected to them. It, it's the, that's the kind of environment that, and so taking that now to the corporate realm, you know, I do work with maybe 70% of my clients are corporates, and if I had to pick a big client over a small one, I would pick the big one, because the big one allows me to work with more and more small ones over time. Uh, because you know, the big co corporates are the movers and shakers, and they're the ones that pay my bills and allow me to experiment and do different things that are not so, so traditional. Uh, and again, I sidetracked, but um, I hope I've contributed to. Oh yeah, no. Um, um, you're, but you're coming in 
um, with an incredibly, um, yeah, I sort of resent the idea that I'm not simpatico with my clients. Um, uh, that's what I did. Um, that's what I do. Uh, but I've very rarely been in, because we're coming from incredibly different positions, is they're hiring me to do something. I'm seeing that the way they're approaching it could be vastly improved. And I'm trying to explain why and how. But in fact, they're not interested. What they want is, so, this, I'm, talk, I'm now talking about New York advertising. Oh. Well, that's a, that's a separate beast. <laughs> well, it's the beast I was talking about. <laughs> you know, which is where you're dealing with people who are incredibly narrow. In, in what they're talking about. I'm not yeah. talking about people who are asking sure. me to create something for them. Yeah. But I'm who are you talking about, Lorenzo? Just about anyone. Really. But I mean, in terms of clients, you're talking uh, about corporate, uh, global advertising, no? As well, okay. as well, yeah. The, I mean, I, I see tremendous parallels between an industry client and an advertising client. And, and there's a disconnect between these? these two worlds, this New York world and this sort of global world? Perhaps, perhaps there is. You know, I've, I, I haven't spent too much time doing business here in the States, maybe two or three years, and uh, another 10 or so in Brazil. So it is, my, pr my perspective is, is no doubt biased. Um, but like I said, uh, I think a lot of the, the bulk of the modus operandi of the past 20, 30 years has been put to check over the past four or five. Uh, so, if, which means that uh, there's, no, there's no more conducive time for different types of behavior to emerge in these kinds of very traditional corporate uh, environments. Um, and I've, I've come into contact, contact with an in increasingly more of these different ways to deal with these kinds of issues and these types of professionals and stuff, you know. And um, I'm, I'm quite hopeful about this change that's taking place. It's, it seems like a, the, the, the sensation is like this invisible revolution that's taking place, you know? To a greater or lesser degree, depending on where you are and what kinds of clients you're working with, but something's happening, you know? And do you agree? Yeah. You, I mean, you work, you're, you're, you work for local projects who have some weight. Like, they're, they kind of, they have a, a reputation. They're known for being really good at what they do. So when you guys go into a when you guys go into a client meeting, you're probably often dealing with people who are looking for yes yeah, some of that some right. more of that. Right. So you you in fact, you know, are often in the position that Neil's talking about. Do you agree with the way that he sees it, or or do you hear what Lorenzo is saying, or is it sort of the same thing? I, you know, it's funny. I actually look look at this question from a, t a totally different angle. I think that. Um, it's it, for me at least. All, all this work is very it's very process oriented, and so <clears throat> the strategies that have been successful are just part of, of of the process. And so we're certainly in a, in a great bargaining position, having won the National Design Award this year, and again, you know, that we got a lot of calls after that, basically, and um, and 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 yeah, our clients typically respect us, but. At the same time, you know, you can't sort of sit there and rest on your laurels. And I don't think that uh, my job never feels like to, to you know, bring in the, the designers on thrones and have them kind of sprinkle their knowledge on the client. Like, I, I think it's very much more about a partnership. So at every kickoff meeting for a project, um, it's critical to define the goals of the project, the project team, uh, who the core working group is, who their bosses are, um, the audience that you're aiming for, um, and I get it, then I get all these things on paper in minutes, which are then signed off on, and so all all of those definitions come right up front at at, at the beginning, and that that's really helpful. Um, I try not to dwell too long on on the goals. Like I certainly try to draw them out and give that that speaking moment to the client um, and document it, but. You know, you could talk about it forever because no one, they, you know, the clients typically don't exactly know what they want, depending on how defined the brief is. Um, another strategy 
that has been really successful lately in a lot of our work is um, rapid prototyping. So one, you know, you'll get a client who, I, my, you know, one of my favorite clients is um, the New York Hall of Science. We did a, a great website for them. We have a bunch of other stuff in production for them. Um, and we do tons of rapid prototyping with them. Um, where you know one strategy they, they you know they want to make these this amazing stuff for middle school kids to learn science and we um, often they you know they're like but wouldn't this feature be really great or this other feature be really great and this could help and you and then and and as you keep dreaming you want to put you know put the kitchen sink into your app and then it's just a, a bloated piece of crap so um, so what you you know so so the the strategy that I often use is with um, developing min what we call minimum viable products. Um, so the concept with that is you just pick out, you, you try to identify your greatest assumption about your audience and about your I idea for your project. So, um, you know, are kids going to like this activity? And then you build out just the, the kernel of the thing um, and, and test that. And so this, so this strategy of, of, you know, prototyping, okay, what's the next critical feature we want to build in? And then we go test that. And we have access there to kids in the museum like that. So that sort of becomes your answer into the difference between what they want and what they need is you say, well, maybe we just show them what they need and it's not finished yet. Like, or yeah. show them what they need really fast. Right, and I don't know that I know, that I know what they need and, you know, like I, yeah. I, think, I think that our. But if that, you make it and you put it out there, then suddenly you're talking about yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely, but the client, the, it's just, it's important for all of us to, you know, so frequently I'm like, like it, I have to remind uh, you, you know, you're, you as the the conduit between the client and the team, you're you're always reminding the team that the you know the client has very reasonable requests and that the client is looking to build a great product at the end of the day, um, you know, to help whoever their community is that they're serving, and and then you know to remind the client that we're listening and that we you know that that we hear them that we will you know check on the feasibility of all their requests and et cetera. So so I think it's it's very much a, a listening practice between both parties. Is she right? Yeah, yeah it's all yes. about listening. Yeah. What's that? It's all about listening. Yeah. The, some advice I got very, 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 very long time ago from a guy I used to work for said that you know, he, his job was to get inside the head of his client. Yeah. Period. So that might be the answer to the next question, but just you know, just in case there's a, a variation, the the tagline for this event, or one of the taglines, I guess, for the, the the school as a as a whole, is the tools that make you good are not the tools that make you successful. The tools that make you good at what you do are not the same as the tools that make you successful. Um, one word answer, true, false, and then we'll come back to you. Perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> Sit perhaps. Okay. Would you like to hedge as well? <laughs> Confidence. Uh, all right. Wait, I thought the options were true or false. Yeah. <laughs> true. <laughs> true. And listening. True, true, right. true. Okay, true. All right. So let's unpack this. Success is, is subjective. Yeah. So perhaps what makes me good also makes me successful. But what what do you feel makes you successful? Is it you know salary in the salary in the bank? Is it you know, the house you have, or is the sense of plenitude associated with the work that you do every day? So that, as a blanket statement, I, I disagree. But what are the? Let, let me rephrase. Right. What are the tools that make you successful? Ah, good question. Um, knowing your purpose, knowing what gets you up in the morning. That's the most liberating thing in the world. Because necessarily, everything that is rooted in that purpose is the best possible thing that you could be doing, whether it's paying the bills or not. Then you come into other t types of dilemmas and trade-offs. But um, I think that's the, that's the first thing. Just make, making that difficult but all too simple question of you know, what makes me tick? What, what is coherent with everything that I stand for? You know, and to the extent that there are these disconnects between uh, the life you'd like to lead and the life that you actually lead, then you need to kind of address, address that, you know, um, gradually perhaps, but it needs to be addressed. At some point it's gonna come haunting you, you know? Um, so I think that, that's my take. I, I have to agree that purpose is, is what it's all about. And for me, it's, it's having the confidence to continue on the path that I'm on. 
and, and not be swayed. And, you know, a belief that you can become... Ex you, are, you become exactly who... You, you are who you become. And, you know, if, if, if you want to stay true to that... What does that mean, you are who you become? I th um, so if you, if you give in to your beliefs, or if you give in to, if you give in to your creative and, and keep bending, um, I think you lose a certain part of who you are. You have to stay true to who you are, whichever client you're working with. Um, and listening is also a part of that. You have to listen to you know, who they are, what it is that they need, deliver what it is that they need, and stay true to who you are on the path. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So who's you in this case? <laughs> is, is it the, um, our, I read that tagline as the tools that make you, meaning you the creative, um, are not necessarily the tools that make you the creative who needs to get a business hat on um, successful. That's how I read that. Do you think that's accurate? That's what I was reading it as. Yeah. That's what I was asking. Yeah. So, I mean, I, yeah, I think certainly that's the case that, um, that it could be very helpful to, especially many of my creative friends who are trying to freelance, um, to get uh, some more well-defined contracts and schedules and <laughs> budgets. Um, in, in place before they start projects. I mean, I've seen way too many people get burned by lack of definition up front on projects. Um, so I, I think that that's true. For on the flip side though, for my own work as, um, as a, an engagement director, um, which is like a project manager, um, it, it, what, I, what makes a project ha happen on time is that you have to sometimes make sacrifices and you have to be kind of tough with your clients and you know say it's nice that you should want something but um, that's not in the contract so we can't do it um, and you know and 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 also um, the other thing is is remembering to get press about what you do remembering to tell the world about what you do which as a as a good project manager is not something you have time for necessarily um, but but don't forget to get good doc good documentation of what you're doing as you go and um, you know make sure that there are eyeballs on what you're doing because it's probably worthwhile so your your answer to the tools that may make you successful are rigid timeline like you know or rigid process, I guess, maybe, and, and, and making sure that it gets press or making sure that it's seen. Yeah, so that good, good, good definition up front, good okay. project definition up front. Okay, <laughs> um, Somebody said that there was a really important pressing question. I, I, I was just... Probably for Earl, I'm, because it happened right before I started talking. <laughs> um, just relating, like you have to, it, it's a fine line, right? You have to balance your purpose with the client's purpose, and if um, I think, depending on, on what's happening and what the situation is, um, sometimes those aren't always in balance, right? And I, I just wondered if if there was ever any conflict on you made decisions based on maybe your style or what you wanted to do more than what possibly the client. Needed. Yeah, I mean, it's I'm, interesting. I'm going to play, play, play that back real quick. Just Did everybody hear that? Raise your hand in the back if you heard it. <laughs> it's like kind of half and half, so, so I'll try to say it back. Um, Lorenzo's answer, and agreed by Earl, was that uh, purpose is what makes you successful. And the suggestion here is, well, you know, sometimes your purpose as a creative or a creator or um, uh, a technologist is might be different than the purpose that the client is looking for. And so, how do you balance that, or how do you how do you reconcile that, and how do you make those kind of square together? So, in answer to your question, um, it's interesting. It, it it one depends on the project. You can't always find something that you're absolutely in passion by, but you know you can um, do and give all of yourself to, and so therefore I might be doing that in order for the check. Um, there are other things that I do that I'm absolutely impassioned by, and if myself and the client 
can't find a place to meet, I've walked away before. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in fact, I've, I've cut off my nose to spite my face uh, at times, meaning walked away from, from really good money. Um, but the project to me was a, a passion piece, and if I couldn't deliver it, that will go out into the world with my name on it. So, so there's, there's two sides to that. Yeah, just another way to look at that is that it's not about your purpose prevailing over everyone, anyone else's. Right? It's about meeting in the middle through dialogue. Mm -hmm. So if my purpose is to find that space, as small as it may be, of coexistence between my purpose and their purpose, that's where the fertile work will occur. It won't happen on all ends. And like you said, not every connection will be made. There will be moments where you know, both sides will realize it's not the right moment. It's not going to happen anymore. The contract won't be renewed in one or two cases, which are a little more draining. Things are actually rescinded ahead of time. That stuff happens as well. That's when the objective is, in an ideal world, a, um, a benign, outstanding, and wonderful compromise. I found myself, <clears throat> when I started out, I, I started out doing magazine photographs. And I was, it was the glory days. I would hand one photograph to the magazine and they would publish it. Um, but I couldn't make a living doing that. You know, interview was paying 75 bucks and no expenses for a spread. Um, and so I started looking for advertising work. I found that my work was completely of no interest to people who actually paid money for photography. And, um, and in fact, my mentor was a guy called Marvin Israel, and he was a very close friend of Richard Avedon's, and he said to me, why don't you be like Dick, get schizophrenic? And, um, and so I became schizophrenic. And, and I, I was raised in a very, very strict craft tradition um, in England. I was amazed. I don't know if any of you saw the Robert Frank show at the Met a year or so ago. He, it's incredible. I, on, outside the show, there were all these pictures of sort of still lives and stuff he did in Switzerland before he came to the States. Yeah. He was like this hardcore, yeah. trained, yeah. Teutonic photographer. Yeah. And he came to the States and fell apart and became Robert Frank. I mean, it's actually, actually, that's exactly what happened to me. Now I think about it. But, um, uh, so what am I trying to say? So what I did was I used my, my craft skills that were substantial. And I literally, I opened a studio, I, I bought a coffee machine and photographed it. Um, and then I bought a few other mundane objects, photographed them, and like three months later I was getting work as a still life photographer. And so I supported my habit of doing exactly what I wanted to do by doing exactly what other people wanted me to do. And I wound up getting great pleasure out of doing both. Is the answer then to the question uh, what makes you successful? Is the answer craft? That's really dangerous. Really? Um, that's really dangerous because you can also wind up, as I did, a lot of the time doing really mundane work. Mm -hmm. um, I Meaning, as long, you know, I was still doing my own stuff, but uh, the, the, the more I became the guy who was totally dependable, always delivered the job that they wanted. Mm -hmm. Without, with very little input mm -hmm. from myself, mm -hmm. the more, I mean, I had an incredible reputation for photographing big shot executives. I never had a picture of an executive in my portfolio. But the word on the street was, you, you want to get out of this, you know, you don't, you know, to the nervous people. I was working for the nervous people. It's like, use Neil Selkirk. The guy will be delighted because the picture took three minutes, not the 30 he'd allocated for it. It was terrific. His wife loved it. <laughs> Done. <laughs> you know, and, and I made a lot of money doing that. Um, uh, kind of the same as coffee makers. Pardon? Kind of the same as a coffee maker. Right, yeah, <laughs> yeah. In, in, incredibly similar. I mean, just a simple craft, do it, get done. Um, in retrospect, I mean, I think um, sometimes things really, really gelled. You know, get, things from big corporations, you know, that you actually did wind up doing really good work for them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't know where that's going. We're all flirting around uh, 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 something here, and, and, and you know, the answers are, have been good and thoughtful and long, and I'd like to bring it down a little and make it a little trashier. So um, is there, 
anything that you're, that's out there in the world that you did uh, for a client that you're embarrassed? <laughs> and can you name it and tell us where to find it on YouTube? <laughs> Is there anything that you've done for a client that you're embarrassed? Uh, while you guys think, because you will must answer. Be. There must be. There must be something. <laughs> no, well, uh, two years into the company, my, my, uh, the company that I work at is seven years old. So at year two, uh, we land a contract with a large uh, beverages company. And um, Does it rhyme with poke? <laughs> nope. <laughs> All right. uh, but um, so we were asked to develop two new soft drinks, and uh, at the time I didn't realize um, how criminal that would be, uh, given that one third of uh, children in Brazil are suffering from obesity. Uh, I did try to like minimize the damage. So one, the concept of one of the dr of the colas um, <laughs> was um, good catch. It's called. The name of the brand, Mineral, which is everyone tries to innovate with in the extract, in the cola extract, which is 0.5% of the actual drink. We decided to try to innovate in the 99.5%, uh, which is the water, uh, saying that that cola uh, would be with mineral water um, from crystalline sources uh, throughout Brazil. And uh, the concept w went really well uh, in testing, but there wasn't enough mineral water to um, meet, meet the demand. <laughs> so it, wasn't, it didn't even go to, uh, it wasn't even manufactured. And the other one was uh, a, a cola with uh, poly minerals and polyvitamin inside the, the cola. And again, went very well, um, but uh, it was approved by the market, but not by the leadership. And then the competitor came out with the same uh, a variant six months later, and it was like a tremendous success. But still, it's, it's cola, right? And no one can argue that that's, that's a healthy option. It's just not. You know, it's, it's, um, there's, there's the fine line between drinking a, uh, um, a reasonable amount and not drinking a reasonable amount is, is, is very, is, 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 you know, it's almost arbitrary. So um, that's one situation where I potentially uh, had these products gone to market contributed to uh, a pretty serious issue that's you know, hurting a lot of people. It's a so-so answer because it's not out there in the world. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, higher forces intervened. Higher forces intervened. Yeah, exactly. Right. But I'm embarrassed that I even took part. It was like a four-month endeavor, which I was like, you know, all in. So. All right. You mean creatively bad, don't you? I do. Yeah. You mean I, I, I want something like embarrassing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I want. It, I want just a little trashy for a second. Well, there's all those broken websites that you and I worked on together. Um, for the, I we, didn't work on those. We, oh, come on. <laughs> yes, you did. Jeff and I worked on, on many, many we projects with the Artist Swoon building um, boats. And um, anyway, all of our, all of our word, like, crappy WordPress sites got attacked by malware, and like, none of them exist anymore. Um, except one is now this like, in, like, reprehensible Tumblr page. Um, but, no, but in terms of my own projects, um, in 2004, I worked for this thing called Chat the Planet, um, which actually was, was really cool. What the planet? Chat. Chat, chat the it planet. Was very, it was, yeah, could have used a little branding help. But anyway, it was, um, it was a cool project. It was like kids sitting on the set of TRL. At, you guys remember TRL at MTV? OK, I'm old. So, um, and, uh, and, and then they would talk to, to kids in Baghdad over two-way television, which is like Skype. Um, <laughs> but, but they would, so we, so my job was like, was, was like, go deal with the website. And so they, so w we built you know, profiles for, for people to like make their, their little, uh, you know, I'm a kid, I'm a, a viewer from around the world. And then we built, we used this product called Flash Communicator to like build like a Skyping thing basically in there. Um, but the lesson from that, that early social networking project was, that you can't build a giant social media platform without proper support to roll it out. So now, if I, if I were to do that whole project again, I would have made sure that I had the right marketing and design resources in place 
<clears throat> and development resources in, in, in place, but we did our best. It looked god awful, um, but it doesn't exist, so I can't show you it. <laughs> Carl. Carl. I know, <laughs> I know you don't want to do it, but there must have been something. You know, it's interesting. Um, I only like about 5% of my work. Um, I never look back at any of it. I can't. It kills me. Um, why? But that's not, why, I don't know. It's just... Um, does, it, is it, does it have something to do with you, or something have, does it have something to do with the clients? Or? Well, it was, it was never exactly what I intended it to be. Um, but I, there, there are a couple of projects that... Um, uh, there's one project that was never finished um, that um, the, it was for a corporation and um, the, the then head of co the corporation was moved out and then another big time Charlie Bananas was brought in and the new big time Charlie Bananas didn't want to touch anything the, the existing head had been involved in and I'd been working on a project for that company for a year and a half and so it was shelved and then it was finished by them and put out there in the world um, with my name on it and that was extremely painful yeah. and that was that was a passion project mm -hmm. that was um, that was a year and a half in the making and then so you know so that was I'm not going to name it yeah <laughs> but that was um, not very nice and is the thing that's embarrassing just the pain of it? Or is it that yeah, you I never finished it? I, I, I or is it the quality of it? Or is it just that reminder? Um, I think it's all of those things. Yeah. It's the reminder, um, the fact that it was never finished, the fact that it was a passion project, um, one of my most passionate projects. Um, yeah, and the fact that... Um, you know, I hadn't given birth to it yet, and it was it was taken. <laughs> Possibly the worst cover of Esquire magazine ever. Really? Mm. <laughs> um, it was called The Best of America. And um, I'd gone around the country. It was a, one of those dumb service pieces. I'd gone all over the country photographing what, what people year, in roughly? various... Oh, a long time ago, thank God. Um, Decade? Oh, 70s. Okay, um, awesome. And, um, and I'd gone all over the country, and one of the things we did, you know, St. Louis, you go for antiques, and Philadelphia, you go for the pretzels. And the best thing in Texas was the stewardesses on what was then called Texas Southwest Airlines. Um, <laughs> and I can't remember any of the other things. And on the cover, they put an antique chair with the stewardess holding a pretzel. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it was, the background was green, and she was the, 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 the her, she was in orange hot pants and things. And, and they looked at the picture and realized it was a catastrophe. And, and at that time, I don't know how many of you people have heard of Jean-Paul Goud. He's the guy who, um, he's sort of genius. He was, the, he was their style person. He's the guy who designed the, French celebration of the 200th anniversary of the French Revolution in Paris, and they had sort of Russian soldiers marching under rain clouds. I mean, he still does all this incredible stuff. And, and he did, he, also, he was also, he retouched massively on sea prints um, using oil paints, but he did it so well that everybody thought they were original photographs. One year he won the AIGA gold um, award for photography, and he said it's not a photograph, it's a painting. Um, but uh, but Jean-Paul, who was also, oh, wait a minute, he was married to um, Kiki Smith and Grace Jones. He's the guy who gave Grace Jones her haircut. I mean, he's just an incredible style maven. And uh, he took one look at this woman who was very flat-chested and painted enormous boobs on her. <laughs> and, and, um, and, you know, and that was the cover. The woman saw it. She said, if my grandmother sees this, she'll die. <laughs> Sued the magazine. I mean, it was a complete catastrophe. It was a ghastly photograph and cost them an incredible amount of money. You know, that's, and it's really embarrassing. I mean, the, the picture is bad. And it ran. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, so where did that one go wrong? 
Texas pretzels. Let's start with the concept. I mean, you know. <laughs> All right, so I'm getting the sign. We have, we have one more question to go around. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to the, to, the, to the copy that you guys are holding in your hands again, um, which is this is, the, this is the Wanderla School of Selling Out. So um, in the context of your work and your work with clients specifically, what does selling out mean? And, and is this something that we want to do or something that we want to avoid? I just spoke. <laughs> Ian, can you start? Yeah, I, I mean, no, who wants to sell out? What a terrible thing. Um, what does I, that mean in the context of, of, of your work with your clients? What, what would selling out even mean? Selling out, I, the, categorically, would mean um, making the same crap over and over again. So we just produced this wall, or we, we built this, um, a whole bunch of interactives in Cleveland at the Cleveland Museum of Art it includes this 40-foot touchscreen wall that displays the entire art collection at the same time, and then like an, an iPad app where you can like save your collection, and then you can run around to the artworks and get like augmented reality content about the different pieces, and there's all this body detail, all this crazy stuff. Um, so people call us and ask for walls all the time. <laughs> and we're, you know, or like we did a project StoryCorps in, you know, we collaborated on the project StoryCorps. It was a storytelling booth where you go and interview a loved one um, and you get a recording to take out. Um, and so for years, people would call us up and ask for story booths. Um, well, you guys are the story booth guys, right? So can, can you give me one of those? Um, you know, but I think that that at least for, for us, we're always trying to, you know, do something different and something that's very unique to the needs of our particular client and that helps to push them um, in a design sense and also that helps meet their goals better. So I think that, that you know, every, I, I guess, I mean, artists go through this, this too, you know, being expected to, to be the artist who does that one thing. Um, but I think it's really, really important to keep pushing boundaries. I'm really excited about your answer because I, I'm anticipating that it's not gonna be the same definition for all of you guys. Um, yeah, you want to go? No, you go. All right. Just let me know if you need anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was a human connection right there. <laughs> I feel with everyone here. It's crazy. <laughs> but no, so the purpose of my company is to accelerate change where it's most needed. So if I were to sell out on that purpose, I would not be accelerating change where it's most needed. So I'd be at the service of maintaining, sustaining, preserving a way of doing things that I know, that we know is outdated, is obsolete, is unfair. Mm -hmm. and oftentimes is very destructive. So the idea, and now within the context of business, that you can generate value at someone else's expense or at something's expense, whether it's the planet or, or just people, is passe, right? We're, we're, we didn't have the consciousness 20 years ago to have this kind of discussion. Now we do. Now we know that it's not a zero-sum game, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, we need to accelerate the shift in mental model so that people can come to the realization that whatever value is generated should be distributed and should be shared. And that's the only way to sustain profit over time. Right? So uh, that whole idea of, of doing good is, is what's going to allow you to do well over time. So if we're in a situation where we see that profit-driven considerations are having a, an excessively preponderant, preponderant, preponderant role in a specific decision, that's when we need to intervene and say, hey, it's not just all about profit. In fact, Looking at, through, looking at it through the lens of profit, you won't be able to sustain this profit in the long run. So let's have a more systemic approach. Let's start understanding things in, in, in a broader way, in a more zoomed out kind of way. So if at those moments we don't intervene compassionately, like we talked about before, then I'm not at the service of change. I'm at the service of just preserving a model that just isn't good for us. You know? I think I disagree with the 20 years, but I think that's not the point of what you said, so maybe sure. we'll move on. You think it's 10? <laughs> What's that? 10 years, maybe? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Good? So, um, it's a definition, right? That's what you asked for. In the, in the, in the context of, of your work and the context of your work with clients. I think that that's, um, it's absolutely unique to each individual what selling out is, and it presumably is something to do with 
um, violating very important principles of your own for money. Um, it's not something that other people... It's You do it to yourself um, if you're going to do it. Um, but it's... I'm not going anywhere with that. It's a great note to end on. I mean, if you yeah, want to, yeah. if you want to like hold it, hold at that. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's mean, very meaning, quotable. You know, and and uh, it's it's in, it's just a very personal thing, you know, and and uh, you don't have to do it. Uh, but a lot of things that are considered to be selling out probably aren't selling out. That I've been talking to people ever since I knew I was going to be on this thing about it, and I was talking to a, you know, painter last night. So there's no such thing. You do what you do, and. Um, if you violate it, then you've almost, it ceased to be selling out. It becomes your new paradigm. Mm. Good. <laughs> I like that. But what if you have really terrible principles to start with? <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. Well, is it just selling at all? Because I think when you guys wrote the description that you were being very, I'm pointing at Ida and Nathan, that you were being very tongue in cheek and that you were actually encouraging artists to get a decent business hat on so that they can be paid for their work. And I think that, that that's really kind of a, a noble idea. The idea of selling at all, um, you know, so you can, you know, support yourself is, is probably a good thing. Questions will be soon and you can ask them. Okay. Anyone, but <laughs> we're going to let Earl finish. I don't have a complete answer for it um, other than it is, a, it is, you know, it's, it, it's personal to, to, to every individual. Um, what is selling out? You know, I was, I was in a meeting with a friend last night who has been working on a project for the last 10 years and he's just about to cash it all in and hopefully make lots and lots of money. And I looked and I always thought he was involved in this piece from a very, you know, um, impassioned emotional level. And I think, I think he is, but I was kind of shocked that he was prepared to sell all this and move on to the next thing. I don't have a... I don't have... Um, I mean, for me, selling out is, is knowing that um, I'm lying to myself in whatever it is that I'm doing. And I find it really, really difficult to, almost impossible to create fluidly with, with, with that going on. Um, I did commercials for a few years and couldn't stand it um, and just acted it all out. Um, and, you know, played with the clients and, you know, did all that stuff, but it was driving me nuts. Um, that's all I have to say on it. It's, 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 um, it's, it's very personal. All right. All right. Let's, go to, uh, uh, let's give him a hand really quick. Yeah, let's have a hand for these guys. So uh, we're going to have a few questions. I think Ida actually has the first question. Um, when I was talking to Jeff about this panel, I was saying that in, in the previous discussions, in the previous discussions, we seemed to always find a bad guy. Um, and the discussion would somehow, everybody would somehow decide who the bad guy was. And I was like, I hope the bad guy is not clients. I'd be really disappointed if the bad guy is clients. There's got to be a different bad guy. And so I was really excited to hear you all identify, or what I heard as the, the bad guy is actually the client's fear. And so I'm interested in what fear in the client are you most uh, excited or gratified in destroying? What was, the la what was the tail end of that? The, what, which fear are you most gratified uh, to destroy? Fear of one? <laughs> <laughs> well, well said. <clears throat> Great question. Wow. Yeah. No, you shouldn't destroy that. The fear of help to use an open. And they're not even trying to create a market. Uh, they're trying to help the image of the firm. They're trying to sell something. They're trying to achieve an objective. And they're coming to you to help you do that. Now, you have to understand what the hell that fucking objective is. 
And as far as I can tell from the discussion, for example, the, the comment that was just last May, couldn't possibly be the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Um, who wants to intimidate a client? Um, I, I, I worked with architects, and they tell me repeatedly that the worst situation they can face is when the client is intimidated by them, or they are intimidated by the client. Because in either case, a communication stops. And it seems to me that you have to emphasize those skills that enable you to listen to people. And I haven't heard that from any of you. Isn't it that? And it's so striking because you're successful, or you wouldn't be. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, the thing that seems to me that is most important for success, you've ignored. Why? Well, we talked about empathy, I think, for a good chunk of this conversation. And empathy is a way of listening. Right? and creating that identification with your client, which then results in the different votes of confidence that are given between, them, so between the two. So in, in that respect, I think there's a lot of listening going on, perhaps not in the traditional sense, where you come to a meeting and you receive, you're bombarded with a laundry list of different objectives. And oftentimes, at least in my experience, it's because the types of projects that we embark on are to deal with situations which are rather unprecedented. So not even, the client wouldn't even know the 8 to 10, 12, 14 things that he wants to accomplish through that project. So listening happens through empathy and through feeling and through uh, kind of seeing between the lines and, and connecting different things that were said over here by this person with that person and putting something together that frames the challenge that, that you're taking on. Uh, so I think, I think listening is, is almost a, a default kind of thing that you do, but you do that using different types of tools. I think it's absolutely imperative to listen to your client and, and understand their needs completely. I was taught um, by a wonderful producer about 18 years ago in a meeting that I kept butting in on. We walked out, we got in the elevator, she said, why the fuck don't you just listen? And I remember swallowing that pill. And the point I'm trying to make is I work with clients still today who don't understand what it is that we understand in what needs to be delivered. Um, and what happens there is there's a fear that happens because they, they, there's a gray area. They're, they're going to let you go and do what it is that you do, but they need to control it in some way, shape, or form versus letting you go and doing it, trusting you to do it. I understand what they need. I understand like the building of the company or, and all the, all the facets of what's needed for them um, and beyond that, um, and that comes from listening, but then being given the trust to go off and, and do what's needed as a creative is, is my frustration at points. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I, I mean, to extrapolate your position indefinitely would be to listen until you're just crawling around on the floor. You, you are hiring me for out of thousands for expertise which it is reasonable of you to assume that I have. I can listen to you and then I will give you my very, very best advice and give you an idea of how it should be done. And if you happen to be incompetent, small, um, inexperienced, and not subject to um, reassurance, then there's a point where I say, fuck it. You know, and I think if I don't, if it isn't that point, then I'm not worth hiring. Selling out is easy to do. It's not so hard to find a buyer for you. When money talks, you're under its spell. Ah, but what do you have when there's nothing left?